Uh, well, first I want to say that the uh, Simons Institute is a really nice place and thank you very much for the invitation to be here and also to the challenge of giving this lecture. Uh, of course, I will try to say something in this lecture, but I'll have, try not to say too much to the colleagues in theoretical computer science that so nicely showed up, but I try to t tell things to people who, who are not in the field. So I really want sort of to create a feeling for what kind of things we're thinking about, you know, give, tell you some results and also some open problems, actually. That, and you'll see that some of the open problems are so easy you, so you can go home and think about them directly. And, uh, well, the hope is that you'll understand some of it. So if I start losing you and speaking too fast, you know, please raise your hand and say that, uh, ask questions. I think that always adds to the talk. Yeah. So what's efficient of computation? Well, there's sort of a theory side and a practice side to it. And on the practice side, you, in fact, r run, come into it every now and then. So for instance, if you're in a big city which has good public transportation, the question how to get from point A to point B might be difficult. You expect your search engine to return it within a second, and that's sort of doable as you, you can experience every now and then. Sometimes you don't get as good answers as you hope, but that's a different point. Um, the other sort of end of the scale is whatever you can do in real human time, and something that's been a little bit on the topic recently, say that, you know, can anybody or, say, the NSA break the AES encryption with reasonable amounts of computation and say that's like a 1,000 PCs in, in, in a year, say. And this we don't know the answer to. I would guess no, but nobody knows for sure. Or maybe the NSA knows for sure. Um, but what I'm, you know, the Simons Institute is an institute for the theory of computation, so I'll do theory for essentially the rest of the talk. Every now and then I'll say something in practice. And how, what's efficiency in, in theory? Well, we have a problem. We have a problem of a certain size, which is usually parameterized by number n. And we sort of ask how many elementary computations do you need to to, to perform something. So let's do something very simple, you know. Let's multiply two numbers that you should think of really big, you know, a thousand digits or a million digits or something like that. But I made it slight, so I made it for five digits. So the question is, suppose we all, you know, that's one of the, what we thought was mathematics once upon a time that, you know, I get you to, to multiply large numbers and suppose you multiply two five-digit numbers, we, we set it up like this, or at least did in Sweden when I was in in whatever is, you know, middle school, or what, no. And then you add it up, and then if you think about it for a while, this sort of says that the number of multiplications and additions of one-digit numbers are about 4n squared, where it would be like 100 elementary operations doing this 5 by 5. You know, you need to multiply each digit in one by a digit in, in the other and so forth. So the question, the question we love to study now, is this the best possible? Is it, or is there a more efficient way to do this? And the first thing I want to say is, well, this is obviously the best possible for multiplication. Okay? Because you have you know, n digits in, in the first number, you have n digits in the second number, you need to multiply each digit in this one by the other. Right? How many feel that this was sort of a proof? How many people felt that this was sort of a fishy argument that you sort of wasn't really, couldn't be formalized? Okay? So that was a theoretician. So you know, all the theoreticians know that this was completely bogus, right? But some of it were a little bit caught up, no? Nobody dared raise their hands on the first one. But, yeah. So this is completely wrong. It sort of assumes that we're going to do multiplication the standard old way, and, and sort of the name of the game is that we don't want to do things the way we've always done them. We want to do them in a more efficient way. Uh, so how do you do multiplication? Well, for those who have a little bit of background, I mean, multiplication is really convolution if you think about it, if you know what convolution is. And if you don't, you can start listening at the next slide. Um, and then you really think of your numbers as vectors of digits. You do some fast Fourier transform. You multiply the transforms, and then you do an inverse FFT, and then you cl clear up the result. Okay. 
And in fact, if you do this, you have to choose certain things, you know, where, where you're going to do the fast Fourier transform, how you're going to do the, 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 the multiplications of the, the point-wise multiplications and a few details. And as late as 2007, you know, this algorithm was actually improved to get a better running time, and it's essentially n log n. It's a little, a small factor which, which grows to infinity, but it's essentially n log n operations. And this was an improvement at there was an improvement of a previous algorithm that was the champion for th 35 years by Schoenhagen and Strauss. Um, so uh, what I want to point out is that some so easy operations, multiplication of large numbers, we don't know how to do it efficiently. You know, we, we keep finding better ways to do it. And we don't know that it's hard at all. You know, we, we're nowhere close to improving that n log n is the best possible. It's quite possible that you can do it in 10 op n operations, where you have n digits in each of the numbers. And operations, I mean, you know, multiplications of one-digit numbers. So this is the first open problem that you can go home and think about whether this is possible or not. I would suspect it's not, but, but <laughs> who knows? Um, good. Uh, so this is sort of saying, you know, n squared is not so good, n log n is better, and this is what would really be utopia. But for the most of the talk, I really want to do theory theory, and that's sort of saying that any function of operation that grows a little bit slowly with, in, with the running time, with, sorry, with the input size, like a polynomial is good. And even a polynomial like this, which almost doesn't appear in, in practice, will be considered good. But anything that grows faster, in particular exponentials, is bad. That means that the running time will increase so quickly with the input size that, in fact, we cannot do it. And the, the, here, we're, the green curve is 2 to the n, and the, the blue curve is x cubed. It's just saying that what really matters is that, you know, how does running time increase as the input size goes up? Uh, so let's take the, the favorite of all you know, problems, which is the traveling salesman problem. And you have a salesman that here is Sweden, by the way, Norway, Finland, Denmark. And the question is, he has 100 cities in Sweden. He wants to visit them as quickly as possible and travel as, as little as possible. And, and some of you, this sort of map, even if you don't see the cities, gives you a lot of intuition. But once you're in a computer, you should really think that, you know, you just give you distances and you're supposed to compute the best way to do it. And if you're, I just gave the five biggest cities and then it's sort of clear how to find the, the, the best ordering, you just try all possible orderings. That's a very quick way to do it. And it turns out that you should go from Stockholm to Uppsala to Luleå to Gothenburg to Göteborg and then to Malmö. Okay. So let's return to our the, the situation where we had 100 cities. And then it's sort of clear how, how should we do the... the um, we can do the similar, similar things here. We can assume we start in Stockholm, which you always do in Sweden. And then you have 99 possibilities to the first city to go to, and then 98 for the second, 97 for the next. And then sort of if you multiply all these numbers, that's the number of possibilities you get. Okay. And this seems like it would be a pretty big number, but you don't realize exactly how big a number it is from your, until you write it out, and this is sort of the number of possibilities we would have to try. And uh, this number, for those who are not experienced, is so called 99 factorial with an exclamation point. And this is something you could try in a contract with a non-mathematician if you just write an exclamation point after the, the sum and they somehow and they tell you how they're, they're going to pay the actual sum. They actually owe you a fair amount of money. <laughs> the question is if that would stand up in court or not. But that's <laughs> uh, well. So let's just think about it for a while. Uh, computers are in fact pretty fast, and the standard computer on your desktop makes a billion operations a second. That's a pretty big number. And if you look at TSP, that in fact tells you that even if you're a very bad programmer, you can do 14 second cities in a second. But in fact, you know, if you want to do 100 cities as you 
might have noticed on the previous page, this would be a large number of seconds. Yeah. And now when you're thinking about billions and lifetimes and so forth, do you expect to live in for a billion seconds? How many people expect to live for a billion seconds? How many people don't expect to live for a billion seconds? Okay. So you're, hopefully most of you are wrong because a billion seconds is 30 years. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a way it sort of tells you a little bit about the, the numbers. So I, I hope to have about a billion more to go, but that's, that's the way life is. Okay. <laughs> So the fact that computers are fast, I think, sort of brings this quote to mind that I wanted to say, is, which is attributed to Knuth, which is one of the old men of the field, says that you shouldn't optimize too early because you know, computers are pretty fast, and if you, it's more important to get the program correctly, and, and then it probably will run fast on an actual computer. But during my lifetime, I sort of felt the other way around. Maybe, you know, complete absence of optimization is even worse because I don't, I, sometimes I can't understand why I have to wait, wait five seconds while the computer is doing something trivial. I mean, it has, in that period of time, it has done five billion operations. That's a lot of operations. So uh, that's a new quote. Okay, but that's not where we were going, really. I want to return to the traveling salesman problem. And in fact, a result by Held Corp, I believe it is, right? Also Bellman. Okay, also Bellman, yes. Prove that, in fact, you can do it in a little bit better than M factorial in time essentially 2 to the n. And, in fact, that sort of says that 25 cities is doable in a second, but still that 100 cities is still not doable in a lifetime. And that sort of, this happened in the, must have been in the 70s or 60s, 70s? 60s. 60s. And uh, we haven't really improved this in the worst case running time. And the, the, the question that sort of steps out at us, maybe this is best possible. May, maybe nature is this bad. Maybe we did need these many operations. And the, the embarrassing thing is that I said before that, you know, we don't know how to do multiplication, that that requires much more time than reading the input. But in fact, it, the same is true for the traveling salesman problem. We don't know that, in fact, you have to read... Imp I mean, note here that the, the input is n squared because we have n squared distances here to read. So you don't know how to do more than read the actual input that you have to do that to actually compute the best tour. So this is where we're at. And our hope to go anywhere in this world was sort of done by forming the NP-complete problems. And I won't tell you exactly why they're called NP-complete and so forth. All I want to say is that th this is a family of a, a very large number of computational problems. None of them is known to be solvable in polynomial time. And they have the property that if one of them is solvable in polynomial time, so are all of them. And this question whether none of them or all of them are solvable in polynomial time is the famous question that whether MP is equal to P. And that's, well, it's really the main open question on computer science. And when I started in the 80s, we, th we thought we would soon solve this, but this hasn't really moved in the 30 years since I've been in the field. And um, there are lots of problems that are MP-complete. I wrote a couple of one. I will return to this one later, but the main thing to note here is that the traveling salesman is one of these problems that's MP-complete. Um, so, as I said, we haven't been able to prove that MP is not equal to P, but I would like to state that, you know, every reasonable research researcher in this area believes that they're not equal. Okay? And this, by mathematics, is, in fact, a tautology, because anybody who believes that they're equal is not reasonable, so that's why we disqualify them from... No, but joking apart, it seems like most people would come to the, to, to the conclusion that MP is probably not equal to P. And, in fact, it seems like an extremely difficult problem. And the problem is that it's very hard to prove that something requires, you know, large computational research, resources. Um, so, really, the way things have been going is that 
we simply assume that this is true. You know, we, we, we prove, can't prove this as a mathematical theorem as we would have wanted to prove, but instead we'll say that this is a law of nature and sort of take a physicist's point of view. And, and then we, we ha try to derive consequences of this law of nature. So I don't, I'm not getting any objections here, which sort of makes me worried, but anybody can object and ask questions. So yes? Yeah. Yeah, so that's of quantum compute. I mean, the next semester at Simons Institute will be devoted partly to quantum computing, right? So I would be extreme. You know, it could be that quantum computer can solve an empty-complete problem. It doesn't seem so. People have been thinking about these problems for, t for 10 years. But let me take my next slide. Suppose we actually, in some word, that P and P actually sort of in, the, in, the, in the really equals P. By this I mean that you know, we have really fast algorithm for M, all MP complete problems. That's a little bit what you're saying. It's a, it's a logically conceivable world. And I think it's a good world in the sense that all planning problems are easy. It's a, it's a good or bad world in the sense that you know, to prove a theorem is as equally, easy to verify the proof, which means we don't need as many mathematicians which mean that we could either think of it as a good or a bad thing for the world. A third thing that I think is that we have no security or privacy on the internet, which is probably a bad thing for the world, but that also might be a matter of taste. But yeah, it could be, but I, I, would, I would be extremely surprised if, this, if we're in this world. I, I don't know how to answer it, but that's... that's. <sighs> good. So now I'm sort of starting to close up on, on, on where we're going. So th th we view the world that, you know, NP is not equal to P. That's our, our, our a law of nature. Traveling salesman problem is NP complete. And hence, we do not think that there will be an algorithm that always solves it correctly and always runs fast. But we want to solve the problem. And then there's sort of two options to go. We write an algorithm, and we have to sacrifice something, either that it sometimes is very slow, or sometimes that it returns a not so good solution. And both these are viable approaches, but I'm mostly interested in the second one. We want an algorithm that always runs fast and always returns a reasonably good solution. So let's see. The first algorithm that possibly comes to mind is the way many of us lead our lives and said, you know, we do one thing at a time and we do the one that's cheapest for the moment. We visit a few cities and we always go to the closest city that we haven't visited and then we, we sort of see what result we get. And if you look at this, for instance, this is very efficient. You know, it's very easy to, to, to calculate what to do next. There are some instances where it does work pretty well, but there are some instances where it works less well. And now we're sort of interested to say, you know, how well does it work? We need to really say what's it, how efficient it is to calculate, but that's sort of an easy point. And, and the question is, how good a solution does it return? And the dominating thing that to evaluate this is sort of to compute the ratio between the solution that we find and the ratio of the optimal solution. And then see what guarantees we can give on this number. So then we essentially want to be really happy we want two statements. The first is a proof that says that we will always be pretty close to, to the best value. And what happens to be the case for the for the um, nearest neighbor, the greed heuristic is that you're, you're, a logarithm, you're at most an absolute constant times log of the number of cities times optimal. You never do something that's worse than this. And the second thing you want is sort of an example saying that, well, this is the best mathematical theorem around. There are, in fact, some instances, you know, there are some sets of distances where this, where this factor of log n shows up. And maybe you, you get a different constant here because we can't always prove the optimal results.
And the sort of the, the, the jargon way to say this is that greedy, the greedy heuristic is a theta log n. This sort of means that this is both an upper and lower bound approximation algorithm for TSP. And the first thing you want to ask is this. This is very bad since when the number of cities grows, the, the, the approximation gets worse and worse. And the first question you ask, is there a, an algorithm that gives you a ratio that's independent on the number of cities you, you're visiting? Um, and this, again, you know, was a sort of a extremely natural question that was around. And Christophides already in 1976 said, well, let's see what kind of efficient algorithms we have. He said, well, finding a mean cost spanning tree is easy. Finding a mean cost matching is easy. And then, in fact, that's all we're going to do. So if this sketches a little bit too fast, let me do it in pictures. This is a graph. Okay. So what's a graph? Well, these are sort of cities, and these edges are sort of uh, Rows between the cities, they should really have distances, but I didn't put the distances there not to clutter the picture. So the first thing is to find the spanning tree. So a spanning tree is just a set of, of, of roads that in fact connects the cities somehow. It's not a, a tour, but it sort of connects them a little bit. And it's very efficient to find an, the, the cheapest spanning tree, you know, the cheapest set to, to connect them so that you can go between all the cities. Uh, this, has, this sort of has a big problem that you need to go back and forth between these two things. So what you do is you take the, the, the guys of degree one, and in particular the odd ones, and you add a matching to these. So you need to make it a little bit con more connected, so you take the, the guys of odd degree and add a matching of these. Which in, and the union of, of the... So the cost of spanning tree, sorry, the cost of the spanning tree is never more than the cost of the tour. The cost of the matching turns out to be at most half the cost of the tour. And then to make it a real tour, you just need to make shortcuts that this here really looks like a tour, and the problem is you're visiting this too many times. So the second time you want to visit, you just go directly to where you're going, and that sort of creates a nice tour. So the second homework problem I want to give to you guys is that you're now we're having a TSP and I want you a polynomial time algorithm that finds a, a, a tour that's always a little bit better than 1.5, say, say 1.49. Okay? This is an easy homework problem and we have been working on it for 37 years. Okay? So when I first read, when I was in, in grad school, I got this 1.5 algorithm and said, well, we should soon be able to improve this, but nobody has been able to improve it, and people have been working more and more aggressively on it. And it's really a, a, an easy to state problem that we don't know the answer. Okay. And when you go home and work on it, I just want to say that you want something that beats a factor 1.5 on every input. You know, getting on something on, on some nice inputs, that's sort of not too hard. You also want to make sure that, you know, the distances are completely arbitrary. You shouldn't, for instance, if you work with, you know, flying distance, the distance between points in the plane, this is, in fact, easy to get, well, not easy, but it's possible to get a, a factor better than 1.5, and it's been known for 15 years now. We really want the fact of 1.49, and the only thing you can use about your distance function is that it's based the triangle inequality. And this is an extremely you know, intuitive inequality. It says that going from A to C, it, it's, never bad, it's not worse to go directly than to go via a city B. That's, that's all you may use. Okay? Is the problem clear to you? You can deliver it at next Simon's lecture, and then you can give it to me, and then we, I can be a co-author. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but where we're going, if you can't solve this homework problem, it's maybe 1.5 is the best possible constant. And um, we note here that if it's going to be the best possible constant, then in fact we have to assume that mp is not equal to p. Because if mp is equal to p, then in fact we can solve it optimally. Okay. 
And, uh, but this is a law of nature, so I, I'll, well, I'll, I'll state this every now and then to remind you that we have this law of nature. But, but, uh, and, but turns out is that, well, we can't do, but we can do something. And it turns out that we can prove that you cannot get very close to optimum, at least you have to be off by almost a percent, unless NP is equal to P. This is uh, this constant has been going up slowly and slowly, and this is a result by Karpinski, Lampis, and oh, I forget my message, who is this at this point, but uh, from this year. So this is a, a slow improvement, but there's a substantial gap. Here. Uh, for the moment, that's all I wanted to say about traveling salesman problem. I'll, I'll return to it in the end. Anybody wants to? Ask something about TSP. Yes? So, uh, between P and NP, is there another class of problems that, you know, and then also what about your problems that are even worse than NP? Yes, yes, yeah, no, the, I'm making a huge oversimplification. There are lots of complexity classes, right? Some between P and NP, and, they're, they're, and on, above NP, there's always a tremendous number of complexity classes. So, yes, there are lots of classes. No, well, this is, of course, a matter of, of personal taste, right, which problems are interesting. But I, I think NP is really the basic. I mean, it captures all these planning problems and optimization problems that show up in, in practice. So it, it's my favorite class. And some of them are more difficult problems, but we can't, we can't, we have to get, get to extremely, extremely difficult problems before we can actually prove that they're difficult. There's a complexity class P space, which is above which is bigger than NP, and also those we can't prove is hard. But if you get to, yes? What about between P and NP, like N to the fifth? Uh, precisely time N to the fifth. Well, for example, I mean, that's absurd. But no, it's not absurd. It's a good, good time. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because, you know, you know, I do more practical stuff. Yes. N to the hundred is no better than two to the N in practice. Yes, I have to agree with this. Uh, no, I, I completely agree. I, I'm, I'm, we at the, the we we'll just wait for Simons to don donate money to the well, practical. If you, if you can prove that you can't do factoring better than the end of the hundred, that doesn't break security. No, 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 of course, yeah. No, so be, being more serious, uh, I mean, I love this question about multiplication, right? So we can't even prove that multiplication can't be done in linear time, and proving that anything. Yeah, I mean, distinguishing n to the fifth, you know, that would be great. I mean, proving that. So, yeah. But we can't ex answer even these very coarse questions, right? And once we've answered those, I would be extremely happy to see a proof that MP is not, you know, not contained in n squared time. Right. So, well, it does it raise a question about the nature of the reduction. So, I guess the question is how sort of, how much of the efficiency do these reductions is there a classification of better reduction versus worse, for example? Yes, there is. But, yeah, so, so this, what Mike is referring to is that we have all these, uh, you know, NP-complete problems that are of similar complexity. The question is, well, there's a big difference between 2 to the n and 2 to the square root n. And, but, and this has been studied, and that would be, you know, I'm, I'm giving you an extremely simple black and white picture, which should be refined in many ways. I agree. Yes, you took the member. But I'm happy for questions. Yeah, so I, sorry, I, I stopped this. So now I want to go to another favorite uh, people question for, for, com for complexity theorists, and that's formulas over Boolean variables. And uh, Boolean variables I'll denote by x with a little index down, which is called x sub i. And this is sort of, this is, and the bar over it is the negation that sort of says you should treat it the other way, turn true into false and, and false into true. And um, this little thing is a logical and, and this thing is a logical or. So I'll, I'll just to get the, 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 this thing straight, we have two drivers. Alice is driving left, going west, sorry, on the left-hand side going west. That's sort of what x1 says. So if x1 is true, this is true. And if x1 is false, she's driving on the right-hand side. Um, well, I'm 
well, I, I'm cheating you slightly there, but this sort of means that she's on the left-hand side and the complement would be she's on the right-hand side and the same is for Bob and he's going the other direction. And the fact they're not colliding is sort of saying that they're both on the left or they're both on the right, right? And both on the left says that x1 and x2 is true and that they're both on the right means that it's both true that x1 is false and x2 is false and that sort of says that there's no collision. Anybody who's not a computer scientist that's happy with this? That's unfortunate. <laughs> 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 if you're unhappy with this and want to understand it, please ask a question. Right? This is sort of a Boolean variable that says something is true or false. And this says that x1 and x2 is true, which says that Alice drives on the left going east, Bob drives on the left going, going, sorry, going west, and Bob is going east. So this says that they're both driving on the left, they're in the UK, and they're not colliding. Right? Here says that they're both driving on the right, they're in the US, and they're not colliding. So this is that they're both in the UK. And then you can sort of play around with these logical formulas and, and you can sort of, uh, turns out that this is logically expressing exactly the same thing as you negate one of the variables, you move the ors around and you put an and between them and you have the and of two little ors of size two. Okay. And now you immediately can go to bigger formulas and say, you know, I now have five different variables. I have the ands of lot, lots of little small things, which is each the or of three variables. And the question is, can you satisfy all these constraints at the same time? What do you think, Mike? I mean, you should you first you encourage questions, and then you and then you then you're vicious to the people that ask questions. That, right? That's that's the way to proceed in class, you know. For those, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So you just stare at these things for a while, and then turn out, yeah, in fact, you can satisfy all the constraints. Here's the five variables, and you can check that this actually works out. Okay? So now we're interested in, in this, these kind of formulas. And uh, this, is, this is called the SAT problem, just to, to do some notation. The formula just had this on something called conjunctive normal form, and it has a parameter k, which says that the number of guys in each OR. So this is a 3 CNF formula that I had on the previous slide, and the satisfiability of formulas on, on a 3 CNF formula is called 3SAT. And we're interested in satisfying such formulas. And this one was essentially the first problem to be MP complete, proved to be NP-complete. It's computationally difficult, given a formula like this, to, to try to, to see if there's a satisfying assignment. And he, also here I want to relax it and say, let's instead look at, try to satisfy as many constraints as possible. Okay. So the game is now that I give you a, a formula like this, which you should think of as much larger, but pretty large. And you, I sum, you, for some reason you might assume that there, there's a, some assignment that satisfies all these constraints, and you want to find some assignment that satisfies as many constraints as possible. And, uh, and whenever you're, you're going to see how well an algorithm works, here we have a very nice algorithm which is really thinking as little as possible. Okay. So don't even look at the formula. It's a big, complicated, ugly thing, right? You, not, not too many of you probably read this formula anyhow. And you just set each variable randomly to true or false with equal probability. You just flip a random coin and say, well, x1 should be true, x2 should be false, and so forth. And this has the pretty good property. Well, look at this constraint. It says that x1 should be true, or x2 should be true, or, or x3 should be true. So this, you have three shots at making this true, and sort of with probability 7h, you'll in fact make that constraint true, just flipping things randomly. And this gives, in fact, an approximation algorithm with the approximation ratio of 7h. And the funny thing is that this is the best you can do. This completely stupid algorithm is the best approximation algorithm you can get for, 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 for this problem, which is called max 3 set. 
So if I give you any number that's greater than 7 eighths, which is 0 0.875, like 0 0.876, it's n, it's, unless np is equal to p, you can't find such an, uh, an assignment efficiently. Okay. So it really says that 3sat, which we felt originally was a bit complicated, is extremely complicated. We can't do anything that's a little bit efficient here. I happen to have a student that does a living in solving 3sat formulas, but that's sort of relating more to that instances in the real world are small and computers are fast, but in theory you can't do it. So let's go for something simpler where we actually can do something. And suppose we still have Boolean variables, and I just ask that the only type of constraint you can have that some variable is not equal to some other variable. That's the only type of constraints I will allow. And let's, at the same time, introduce this different problem, which I call max cut. And it's sort of given that I give you a graph here with blown nodes and connections between the nodes. And the question is, divide this into two pieces so that whenever two things are connected, we want them to have different colors. It's called max cut because it's cutting the, the, the graph into two pieces to, to cut all the edges. And here I made sort of a, a way to do this. You know, I colored half the, or some fraction of them red and in a smart way to try to cut as many edges as possible. So let's see if I can get what's... If I had this problem and I had this problem on the previous slide, do you see any connection between them? For a non-theoretical computer scientist here. Does any theoretical computer scientist see a connection between the two problems? No. <laughs> it's the same problem, right? Yeah. An edge is just a, a thing that two things should be different, and the different is blue is sort of corresponding to true, and red is false, and it's really the same problem. Sure? Well, <laughs> I give you Boolean variables, and I should ask them not to be equal. One should be true, the other one should be false. So you want a solution that satisfies all the constraints? Yeah, or as many as you can. If you can't get all, you should get... Some. What would you say is as many as you can? Yeah, yeah but max cut, yeah, if, optimization problem and decision problem. But it's really, right... You want the color red is false, blue is true. You connect two things. OK. Uh, so this is easy. So as, because if you start saying that this should be blue, that in fact all its neighbors should be red. So is, if you want to satisfy, if you want to cut all the edges, it's in fact extremely simple to cut all the edges. Uh, but it gets very tricky if you just want to cut 99% of the edges. And the question, can we find such a cut? Can we find something that's almost perfect, so that almost all the, 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 the edges have endpoints of different color? And what I wanted to describe next is an efficient algorithm for doing this. Okay, that, in fact, this problem is so simple that we can do it. It took us 20 years to come up with the right idea, and this was done by Gummas and Williamson, and I, I'm, I'm, the hope is to convince you of this right idea. That, in fact, if you think, if you change true and false for plus minus one, and E is the set of edges, which is just a set of constraints, we're trying to optimize this, this mathematical sum. Uh, so Gummas and Williamson's great idea was that, well, we should make this simpler, we should, you know, take this product and introduce a new variable instead, which makes this a lot easier to maximize since we don't have any constraints. Uh, but the, the key constraint here is to prove that, uh, to, to want the y variables to form a positive semi matrix with ones on the diagonal, which is sort of not such a, this gets a little bit technical, so the, but I'm just trying to give you a flavor of these things. So what's a positive semi-definite matrix? Well, it's a matrix which has all eigen, if it's symmetric, which it's assumed to be, 
that it's all positive eigenvalues, that in fact as a, viewed as a quadratic form is strictly positive, or it's non-negative. And in fact, this can be factorized as a matrix, the transpose of a matrix from the original matrix. And this is, this in fact, true. The original solution is just a special case when x is the, y is the product of a vector and, and its transpose. Okay. And it turns out that this relaxation you can, in fact, solve efficiently. And in fact, you can optimize any linear function of, of the coefficients in the matrix, giving any set of linear constraints. And the intuitive reason this is true is that the set of positive semi-definite matrices is convex, and, and you're optimizing a linear function over a convex set, and it has no local optima, so some kind of steepest descent should do it, if you studied steepest descent. But let's ignore this sketch if you're not familiar with these things. So backing up, I mean, the alternative way to, to propose this is that you're, you're trying to maximize something like this when the x's are plus minus ones. And instead, you, you say you want to optimize this where this is an inner product between two vectors of unit length. So we're relaxing the optimization problems from, from sort of the real line to, the, to n dimensional real space. And this enables us to be able to solve the problem. So the vector problem, in fact, is easy to solve. And we get a higher objective value. And, and the key problem is now, how do we take a solution to the vector, to the vector problem and, and make it a Boolean solution? And what Thomas and Williamson realized, apart from we should do it like this, is that an extremely simple to round the vector solution to a, to a plus minus one solution. And that's just to pick a random vector and and let the xi be the sign of the inner product. Uh, and the reason this works is that if any two vectors that give a good contribution uh, to the relaxed problem, it's extremely likely that the sign of the two vectors are different. I try to indicate this by the vector, the two vectors, and sort of the bad directions where 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 these signs are different are sort of this narrow cone here, and a random vector over here, for instance, will give a, a good Boolean solution that satisfies the corresponding constraint. And trying to put this intuition in mathematical terms, you just make a variable for the angle between the vectors. The contribution to the objective function is 1 minus cos cosine of this vector over 2. The probability that the two things are cut is the vector over pi. And the minimal quotients of this gives the approximation algorithm for the gamma sum williamson algorithm. So since I, I don't do as much algorithms as harness result, I'm really saying, you know, well, we have this great algorithm that was proposed, proposed in the mid-90s. Is this best possible? And I tried to prove that it's not so far, and I got a lower bound that you can't at least do 16 over 17. That's. And then this has sort of been standing still for an extremely long time. But then in 2004, these two sets of authors studied something called the unique games conjecture and proved that, in fact, if the, that conjecture is true, then the germanson William constant is optimal. And this is sort of a, at least a 50-50 proposition at this point stage of the game. Um, well, M here is Elkhanan Mosul who introduced me, so I should be a little bit nice at least to mention his by, in my name. Uh, so what, so the, the thing I want to tell you about is the unique games conjecture is one of the few things that, and so which is sort of the third homework problem. And this is that I give you a large integer M and I say that now we should have variables that take values in 0 to m minus 1, and I give you very simple linear equations mod m. So this sort of says that when you take x1 and add 11, you should get x3 mod m. So you, if this is greater than m, you, you subtract m. So this is linear equations mod m with two variables in each equation, which is a problem denoted by this. 
And the question now is that, suppose I promise you that you can solve, not solve all of these, then it's sort of easy, but you can satisfy 99% of these equations, or I'm giving you an extremely difficult instance of this where you can only satisfy 1%, can you tell which one it is? And that's essentially the unique games conjecture. So I give you an extremely simple set of equations for them, and, and a sort of 99 is really any number smaller than 100, and this is greater than zero. And this is a computational problem that's really been with us for the last 10 years. And it's more and more open as time goes by. Various algorithms have been proposed. None works for all instances. On the other hand, Whenever people come up with an ensemble of, of instances, there is always an algorithm that seems to solve them. So it's sort of a, a war between these two fronts, and we need some new idea to be able to, 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 to solve the unique games instances. Um, so let me, as a final point, return to the traveling salesman problem. You know, as I told you before, it's you can approximate it between. Uh, 1.5, you can't do something 1.01 essentially. And you know, the question, are we happy? You know, or, or is this really what we want to achieve? And some people said, well, yeah, it's within a constant, and who cares about this constant? And I sort of the other way around say, you know, this is an exciting constant of nature, and we have to find out what it is. Uh, but even if you're not so much into detail, let's look at the closely related problem and say that we have the traveling salesman problem where it might be more expensive to go from A to B than B to A. You know, you might be up in the hills, for instance, in Berkeley Hills, and it's much easier to go to work than to go home. <laughs> and then it turns out that the approximation algorithm across the fields doesn't work. And the state of the art there is that the best algorithm is almost like greedy f for the, the, the standard one. It's off by essentially a factor log n. The hardness results gets a little bit better, but not much. And the question, which of these two is the correct answer? And my view is, well, historically, we've always been better at finding algorithms and analyzing them than proving hardness. But on the other hand, here the situation is extremely picky in the sense that, you know, we do have an algorithm by, uh, proposed by Heldon Karp, and it's been around now for 50 years. And we don't know if it's this bad or it might give the answer within a factor of two. So usually the hard question is to try to find a good algorithm, but here the question is, you know, hey, we have the algorithm, we just don't know how good it is. We know it's fast, but we don't know the, the quality of the result. Uh, so what have I been trying to do this, you know, lecture? Well, I've been trying to tell you about the approximation problems. So, and for some of these problems, we know. Uh, the answer for like max 3 sat, you know, the rock bottom algorithm that gave 7 8 was the, is the best one, and we can prove that this is the case. I gave you some other problems, like asymmetric TSP, standard TSP, and max cut. And in fact, we don't really understand what's going on there. Uh, if we assume this strange problem, the unique games conjecture, then max cut is resolved, but these two other, we still don't get any better results for them. So we can go home and work on all three of these. And uh, well, that's what I wanted to say. Any more questions or comments? You really scared them off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now I, I won't lecture anymore, so I can't. I promise not to ask any embarrassing counter questions. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, if, if, you're solved, if you're looking at a fairly natural problem, there's many people that have, you know, the, these basic problems that are sort of easy to state. Probably somebody already looked at the problem. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, you should, uh, that's, well, yeah, you should, maybe that's, yeah, Google the problem, that's. Uh, so, for, for instance, I had to Google to find the best constant for the proximability of the TSP. You know, it keeps improving all the time, so Google is actually a good, and Google, I'm proud to say, sort of came out a little bit of theory of computation, if we're sort of stretching things a little bit. Not too, too much, but a little bit.